Dr. Nusrat Rabbi is a scholar and an activist on the 1971 Bangladesh genocide committed by the Pakistani army in which more than 3 million people were killed. She has her PhD from Harvard and she has been active in getting recognition for 1971 genocide all across the world, especially in the USA. Her father, Dr. Muhammad Fazli Rabi, was a very well-known and famous heart specialist of his time. He was kidnapped and brutally killed by the Pakistani army. Just a day before, they surrendered before the Indian army and the Mukti Bahini forces in Dhaka on 16th of December 1971. Thank you, Dr. Rabi, for talking to Doordarshan and All India Radio. Let me begin by asking you about that phase in Bangladesh. Tell me about the, the genocide of 1971 and especially the day when large number of intellectuals were, were killed by the Pakistani forces. Thank you for invitation to this program. I'm Dr. Nusrat Rabi and as you mentioned, my father uh, was the leading uh, intellectual uh, who was brutally assassinated at the end of the war, just 11 hours prior to that famous surrender with 93,000 soldiers at Ramna Racecourse to Indian Army and to Bengali freedom fighters. Uh, the genocide took place over a nine month period, but the unrest started pretty much from 1947. The partition that the British did. Interestingly, the British had a similar partition in Israel and Palestine in 1948. Um, some of the boundaries drawn uh, were strictly based on religion and was not respectful of cultural and ethnic differences. So from the get-go, there was a large-scale discrimination against uh, Bengali speaking Pakistanis, obviously East Pakistan at the time where we lived. So we were East Bengal in British India, then East Pakistan in Pakistan, which then later became Bangladesh. But the struggle for Bangladesh really started in 1947. And then in 1952, when my father, Dr. Fazli Rabbi, was a student, Met, uh, uh, participated in the language struggle in 1952, and he was politicized at that time. As you can imagine, all the students were uh, protesting the Pakistan government's decision to declare only Urdu as Pakistan's national language. Um, our plea was to declare both languages as the national language. So in, you know, as I was saying that the war, the mobilization for greater autonomy for East Pakistan and greater resources and less discrimination started in 1947. In March of 71, Pakistan army unleashed an um, incredible dehumanizing and criminal, violent warfare, attack actually, there was no war in the beginning because there was no resistance from us, we were not prepared. Um, so I, I just want to characterize the war, it is a full scale genocide and a lot of institutes have now recognized it, it has been mischaracterized by many sources as a small unrest, a civil war, um, a small disturbance, but actually, as you said, uh, 3 million people died and um, the numbers are actually going up. Uh, we heard that there were 300 intellectuals killed, but actually now that number is over a thousand. And about 500,000 women were raped and killed, women and girls. So this genocide has some unique characteristics that haven't, hasn't been uh, characteristics that haven't been shared to the world. One is it was a mass scale genocide of common people, but on top of it, there were three components. One was the targeting of Hindus uh, and Hindu intellectuals. Second was the targeting of women and girls by using rape as a weapon of war. And the third was a systematic um, 
extermination of Bengali intellectuals, where my father was a part of. So when you consider the totality of the br brutality of this genocide, it's unique in this world. And compared to, to the significance of the destruction and dehumanization, uh, there is very little known about this genocide. And it hasn't been placed properly in world history of genocide. So, Dr. Nusrat, this is now being recognized all across the world yes. in many ways and people like you and many others have been trying hard, including the government of Bangladesh, yeah. to get it recognized formally by the United States and other such organizations. I'm interested in knowing that when it was almost a fait accompli for the Pakistani army that they were going to surrender, what exactly was the purpose of killing the intellectuals the day before two days before or in that period. Of course, many might have been killed earlier. Yes. But the concentrated killing of hundreds of intellectuals during that uh, week uh, of uh, uh, December 1971. Mm -hmm. What do you think may have been the purpose? That's a great question because I think it requires some critical thinking on why it happened. I think we have to look at war and destruction strategy to understand I understand why they did it. And I have an explanation. You know, the British were colonial masters of India. They tried to colonize and dehuman, dehumanize. And taking a page of, from that book and also the fascist book, uh, page, uh, page from the fascist book in Germany by the Nazis, I think Pakistan army took it to a different level by trying various ways of destroying a nation's backbone. So one of the reasons they made this list is why did they take the leading pro, uh, you know, nationalist, patriotic doctors, engineers, um, journalists, um, literatures, and people like that, because they form in their mind and in their spirit was the blueprint of this new nation. And so one of the questions I'm asked a lot is why my father didn't leave. He was a physician freedom fighter. So he treated all the freedom fighters, but he also treated Urdu speaking uh, Biharis and Pakistan army if they came for treatment because he believed in the Hippocratic oath, but he was a physician freedom fighter. And I believe that we won our freedom because my father didn't leave. If you contrast Bangladesh in 71 to Afghanistan now, you can see all of Afghanistan intellectuals have fled. They're in California and Canada and England and country after country has come and exploited the situation and now they have their own government, but uh, Taliban. But one of the reasons we didn't go that way is because our people, our our intellectual stayed and and that is why Pakistan had to leave. Now back to the last part of your question, why did they conduct this killing at the last moment? One of the things I believe that took Dr. Rabbi at the very end, right before surrendering, is if they had taken him earlier, I think they would be uh, you know torn apart by freedom fighters. I really think this is it's a genius as well as a very cowardly act. So in other words, while they were taking the last flight out to Lahore, they did this so they would not be killed as a result because they would not be spared by the freedom fighters if the freedom fighters had found out that my father had been killed. And Dr. Nusrat Rabbi has written this beautiful book, poignant book about that period of Bangladesh's history when uh, her father was taken away and, uh, away and several other things. One part of the book, Dr. Rabbi, talks about the time, the day when your father was taken away, taken away by the Pakistani forces and killed. I know it's a traumatic thing to relive that experience, but could you tell us uh, in brief about that day when they came and took away your father and how your mother and all of you were very young at that time right. survived and what memories you have of that day? 
That day was 15th September, uh, 15th December 1971, and it was a Wednesday. And it turned out that they'd come to our house on Monday, 13th December, under the guise of searching our house. Actually, now looking back, they'd come to uh, sort of see the layout of our house, where the doors are, where the gates are. And they came and they took some money from my mother and they took my father's gun collection. Uh, he, had, he had been a hunter, although he did give away uh, hunting. He had a small collection of uh, British guns and they confiscated and they protested my parents, but they said, we'll get it back to you. But they were sort of looking at the layout of our place. Um, on, and when they left, they created some terror by uh, abducting some young boys from our neighborhood. And I still remember the screams of the mothers from that time. Um, so on Wednesday, um, they lifted the curfew for a couple of days in the morning. And I just want to go back and say all of December, they were lifting and abducting intellectuals and killing them. So it's not just one day. And they would give this curfew all day, so no, nobody could figure out what was happening. This is a day without, this is a time of no internet, and many phone lines were cut. So microbuses would travel from one end to the other, several, 50, 100, and um, lift, lift, uh, abduct intellectuals, take them to the physical training college, torture them and take them at night to Briar Budger killing fields, which is now a monument now, yes. and shoot them. And all of them would scream Joy Mangla before they uh, fell. And since it was in the Bihari Para, a lot of Bengalis didn't know what was happening. They didn't live there, but every night they would hear Joy Bangla from men and women. And they thought it was freedom fighters. It was actually intellect groups of groups of groups of intellectuals being brought in and killed. So that day on 15th, when the curfew was lifted, my father's last patient was actually an Urdu speaking patient. And my father was uh, saw him and bought, brought some groceries. And he was in a very dis little bit on the despondent side. My mother was very, very upset and actually very anxious and he tried to calm her down. We were seeing Indian fighter jets still, although Pakistan had already lost the Air Force fight, but there were still some Indian air, air, air uh, planes on the, in the sky. So us three children wanted to see, see them and my mother didn't like it because there were falling sharp up. People were dying of random events at that time. Sharp objects, sharp nails coming through the air. We went out in the veranda around four o'clock on Wednesday with my father to see the Indian jets. And uh, when he went to my mother's bedroom, she was absolutely pale and cold to the touch. And he said, you have to get up, you know, uh, sweetheart, I'm getting a cup of tea. So we're going to be a free country any moment now. So he called the cook, Kasim, and he said, will you bring some tea? He came and he whispered something in my father's ears. And my mother shot up from the bed. They got very dressed very quickly. And we saw we were absolutely surrounded by army. And let me tell you who came. There was Pakistan army soldiers. We could tell from the faces that they were Pakistan, West Pakistan, Punjabi uh, ethnicity. There were police. Uh, there was Al Badr and Al Shams, which are Bengali uh, sort of militia that they created to create uh, to kill the intellectuals. Um, they were, uh, so the uh, the militia were dressed in uh, dark gray, almost black shirts and brown pan pants, and we were surrounded in the north, south east and west. There was no way to escape. There could not have been fewer than 200 people, soldiers, and they had machine guns pointed to our house from in all direction. I still remember this as my parents quickly put the children in the back of the house because my eldest sister was around 21 years old. And for some reason, my parents having treated all these women 
was very worried about her. But I, I didn't hear anything. I was seven years old for a few minutes. But for some reason, my sister opened the door and just went out. So she actually saw my father leave the house, go down the stairs and leave the house. He was blindfolded and his hands were tied. And from what I, my, when we went out to our veranda or balcony, we had a round balcony and we found her unconscious there. So what had happened is the Pakistan Jawans came up and al -Badr, and she tried to stop them. And she spoke in Urdu and she says, where are you taking him? Why are you taking him? And they made some flimsy excuse that there is a serious and important patient in the cantonment and my mother said he's seen a lot of patients i don't understand this my father spoke to them in bangla because he knew that they understood bangla so he said amar gai had dibana cholo meaning don't touch me and get out of let me i'm going come with me because he didn't want the army to go inside the house and take a look at us either so he left quickly but w when my mother wanted to go, they said, stop and we will shoot. And so she didn't listen. So they hit her on the chest with the other side of the gun. And she lost consciousness for some minutes. And I still remember it was a winter, winter evening. And the azan started to play at the time when we found her. And, and that was how we... Uh, lost our father. Now, in the night time, we understood later that he was executed between two and three in the morning. And my fa mother did hear a scream that my father was screaming out, Tinkuramma. That's sometimes how he would address her. That is the name of my brother. And we believe that that scream was uh, a way for him to say goodbye. And when the sun rose on 16 December, we were up all night. One of the first, first thing my mother said is, this is the sun of our free country, but I don't know if your father will see it. That's a very, very sad story, very poignant story. And I understand how deeply you must be feeling about it even now. Now, coming back to your book, yes. you have named the book uh, the spirit of 1971. Yes. So let me ask you as the final question, what exactly you consider to be the spirit of 1971? Do you think it is holding up in the current Bangladesh? No, it's not. But that's a great question. I named it the spirit of 1971 because I think people should know about it. Maya Angelou said, you should know where you come from so you know where to go. So um, this is another book I just want to mention. I translated um, um, War Heroines Speak. It's about uh, seven stories uh, by Dr. Nilima Ibrahim. It's a compilation, seven stories of women who uh, survived the torture of the war. And this is the intellectual killing and actually a brief history of, the, of that time. The spirit of 71 is really was captured in our family and the intellectuals that came and discussed it incessantly in 69, 70, and 71. There were many aspects to this spirit. One was religious tolerance. A multi-faith uh, community existed of intellectuals in our living room, in our social life, everywhere else. It was almost a renaissance period in in Bangla literature and culture at that time. Despite all the discrimination, it was one of the best times of progressive values. The second is my father, my mother, and all of them believed in w equality of the genders, men and women's equality and equal participation in the labor force. Third is that they believed a very anti-colonial mentality. They believed you cannot have a society where there are a few rich and many poor people to serve the rich. So they totally believed in the um, alleviation of poverty, which actually happened because if you look at Brack and you look at Sarah Abed and Professor Yunus, 
the poverty ele alleviation uh, model is not just worked here, but it's been exported all over the world. So this, this actually became sort of a lab for how to uh, you know, end poverty. This area has been poor for a very long time. I mean, if you remember in the British time, the famine happened here, 73, the uh, famine. So this, this was a big concern of intellectuals. And that is part of the spirit of 1971 is not to have a society that is so, um, you know, uh, sort of dichotomized by class like that, that that there is a chance that anybody can get education, can get health care, can, can have uh, food to eat, clothes to wear. And that and, and another spirit, last one I will say, is they wanted the best for the country. So they didn't want like just good enough. So whether it's medical care or architecture, they wanted Bangladesh to have for example, a friend of mine, I'll tell you, when she rode the new metro rail, she said she immediately thought of my dad. So they had very far thinking ideas of advancement and they wanted them right away for Bangladesh, not a slow way to development like Pakistan had envisioned, uh, just barely enough so we would just produce crops so that that would be an uh, income, but actually being a vibrant economy and country. Thank you, Dr. Nusrat Rabi, for giving such a comprehensive understanding of the period of 1971, the kind of atrocity that Bangladesh had faced, the modern challenges and the contribution of the great man that your father was. Your family has been a patriot in all senses of the word. Word. Thank you so much for talking to Thank Doodarshan you. and all in Radio. Appreciate it.